instruct and guide us. We ask, Lord, that where our ideas are in conflict with yours, that we would learn to submit and surrender and obey, even when it's hard. We thank you for continuing to love us even as we mess up. Thank you for your grace. We pray, God, as we study today that we would leave here changed and transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. Marriage is what brings us together today. Okay, maybe not. Uh, I actually got threatened by one of my sons that I should never do that at his wedding. So he's like, or I'll get somebody else to marry me. I'm like, maybe you won't make it to that age. Anyways, have you ever bought something that said some assembly required? Yes. Right? And really they mean everything is required. And you just have a pile of parts and they expect you to be like Houdini and whoa. And then you have parts left over. The crazy boxes is when they intentionally give you extra parts but don't tell you. You have this perfectly created toy with extra parts. Now you're worried. And so then in the last resort, you pull out the instructions and go, ah, extra parts. Yeah. Marriage should come with some kind of warning label like that. Not some assembly required, but much assembly required. It's an ongoing work, and we need the instruction book of God's Word to guide us through that wonderful, wonderful thing we call marriage. Now, maybe you already decided to turn off. Like You're like, oh, this is not for me. I am not married. <laughs> I won't be married for a long time, or I was married long ago, and that's never happening again. And so you've decided, that's it. But listen up. If you haven't been married, and you're still at that age where that's still a possibility, which pretty much includes everybody, because these days, you never know, uh, you should listen, because maybe God will be speaking some things to you about what that future could look like. If you are married, well, evidently that applies today. Uh, if you've been married and you're like, never again, well, then there's something probably for you as well, uh, and that'll really center around verse 21 when we get to it in a moment. What was marriage like in that day? We know what it's like in our day, right? The statistics are horrible. Everyone's like, marriage stinks. Why even get married? Because everyone just divorces, and uh, the statistics are always skewed a little. Um, when it comes to the church, it actually changes. You know, you, you might have seen or heard of kind of some surveys, and they say, you know, within the church, oh, the, the, the rate of divorce is the same. But that's not true. Where it's true is when they include everyone who puts a little check on a box that says Christian. What it doesn't tell you about that person who checked a little box that says Christian, it doesn't tell you, do they ever go to church? Do they ever read their Bible? Or are they part of a fellowship or a body of believers? It doesn't tell you that. Because if you shrunk it down to that and to people who believe in Jesus, not just, oh yeah, I'm a Christian because I'm American, right? That's how it works. Uh, the rate of divorce shrinks considerably. Hmm. In that day, it was pretty liberal. For the Jews, there was two schools of thought. One school of thought was you could never divorce for any reason. The other school of thought was, well, you know, if your wife burns your toast and you're displeased with that, she's gone. Now, try to guess which was more popular in that day. Yeah. Not the, oh, never divorce, but the, oh, dinner wasn't ready at 5? I said 5, and now it's 5.05, so you're out of here. And all you had to do was write a little piece of paper. I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. Here you go. Nice living with you. You think things are bad now. That's what life was like. You're like, oh, so really, we're not any worse. No, because people are people. Sinful, broken, messed up. That hasn't changed for 2,000 years. So that means the message is still valid and purposeful for us today. What about the Greeks and the Romans of the day? Uh, not better, way worse. In fact, they would have a wife for bearing children, a mistress for other things, little heirs, uh, and then a third one for just kind of hanging out. You're like, That's, how do you keep all that in track? They didn't have like a phone or anything. That's messed up. And so when Jesus comes along, and then Paul comes along and talks about marriage, it's different than the norm. It's different than what they were used to. 
but it was God's intent from the very beginning. We're going to pick it up in chapter 5 of Ephesians, verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore... A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Before we jump into that, we need to get a foundation and a base for what is marriage and where did it come from? And for that, you can turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. It's not hard to find. It's the first book of the Bible. Like, I don't know where it is. Just open your Bible. It's there. Genesis chapter 1. We're going to read a few verses in chapter 1 and then a few in chapter 2. Start in verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. People are more important than animals. We're over the animals. It, that's just how it is. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. There was evening and there was morning the sixth day. It's kind of the overflow or the overview. Go to chapter two. We'll pick it up in verse 15 to see how it happened and when it happened that God created Adam and Eve on the sixth day. Verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Yes, work is not a four-letter word. It is, but it's not. Uh, It was part of creation from the beginning. We're supposed to work. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So one rule. One tree, don't eat that fruit. Easy peasy. Not so much. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit or suitable for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So he's going along, you know, aardvark, aardvark. Cheetah, cheetah. Tiger, tiger. He gets to zebra, zebra. and Hmm. No one that fits me. So, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of the ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is... At last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. They were what? They were naked. Yeah, it's okay. It's in the Bible. What do we see here? We see that God created male and female. And then he brings male and female together in this covenant called marriage. They're like, well, do we need to cover that? In our day, we do, right? Because our society has said, well, marriage is not that. Marriage is whoever wants to be together. Well, 
It may be, but that's not marriage. Right? You can't change something that God has created. So it can be called marriage, but biblically, marriage is between a man and a woman. So, he says, I will make him a helper comparable to him. Someone suitable. Someone to not just assist, but it's used in the Bible in the military as for reinforcements. And if the reinforcements don't come, the war is lost. That's how important the wife was. The man is alone, and it was not good. And all the men were like, that's for sure. And the women were like, oh, yeah. <laughs> just go away for a few days, you know, and leave the house to your husband and kids. See how that goes. As long as there's craft dinner, we're all good. A helper, someone suitable, comparable. Hmm. Like but opposite. Two pieces of puzzle that fit together because they're not exactly alike, nor randomly different. Marriage is a full embrace of the other sex. Right? It's been said, well, it's, I find that I get along better with someone of my own sex. Of course you do, because you have so much in common. That's called a great friend. That's why when you, know, you have a girlfriend and you're a girl, you can talk till the wee hours of the night and you go home and talk to your husband. Go, hey. How, how was dinner? It's good. You're like, oh. It's just not the same. But that's the way God's created it, to take two to be one flesh that are the same but different. Oh. And so God has the first surgery, takes a rib out of Adam, and brings Eve to him. And just imagine that moment. He's like, he's been naming all the animals, right? And <laughs> nothing. He's just like, huh. Cheetahs are cool. Elvins are kind of big. Those giraffes, man, wow. And then Eve comes walking over, singing doo wah dee 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 dum dee dee dee. <laughs> and she, Adam goes, whoa, man. <laughs> and it was over, naked and unashamed. He said, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> That's the foundation of marriage. God's created marriage. He brought man and woman together, and he says, what? For this reason, verse 24, a man shall leave his father and mother. A man, not a boy. You're like, what, what's the difference? When does a boy become a man? Well, some take longer than others. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Don't marry a boy if you're a woman. Marry a man. A man? What? One who's able to provide, who has got a plan. It's like, you know, if your fiancé or potential fiancé goes to your family and says, hey, I want to marry your daughter, and they're like, well, what do you do? I play video games. <laughs> Kick them out. Just come back in five years when you've grown up and you've got a plan to do what? Now, it doesn't have to be a doctor, right? Or a lawyer, like, oh no, we only take doctors in this family. You know? No, it has to be, he has to have a plan though, right? Ooh, are you going to school? Oh, school's overrated. Okay, well, you got a trade? Oh no, I'm just going to figure out stuff. Ooh, run. Right? A, a, a man, not a boy. And one who's ready to leave his father and mother. He's not living in the basement forever and he thinks you're going to join him there because he's got it all set up so nice. <laughs> Temporarily, okay, you know, I had, I had friends who lived with their parents for a summer or something here or there, but not for long term, right? Why? Because you've got to create a new family. So a man who's leaving, and then what? There's a cleaving to one another. In other words, when you have an argument, you don't call up mom, mom, you won't believe what he's done. You don't know, oh, I can't believe it. And so every time you go visit your in-laws, what happens? They're looking at you like you're the devil. You're like, what happened? That's not very healthy or very helpful. You cleave to one another. Yeah. And you hold fast. No one gets in between. It's after your relationship with God, the most important relationship you will ever have. It's more important than your kids. You're like, what? Yeah, because your kids leave, Lord willing. <laughs> it's a problem these days, right? <laughs> But, uh, and they keep coming back, I hear. So I've been praying hard. 
and you cleave to one another, and they will become one flesh. Two become one. Yeah, it's sexual, but it's also the relationship aspect. There's something significantly different about marriage than any other relationship in the world. That's where it comes from. It comes from God, from the Bible. So now go back to Ephesians, if maybe you're already there. In verse 21, it says, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Mutual submission because of our relationship with Christ. Remember, the book of Ephesians is written to the church in Ephesus. So it's written to Christians. Saying, guys, we're to mutually submit one to another. Why? Because chapter 5 says, be imitators of God in verse 1 and walk in love. We're to copy the way of God, which is the way of love. And so we're to mutually submit one to another. And that's going to play itself out in marriage and in the parent-child relationship, in the boss and employee relationship, mutual submission. They would change how we do even church, right? I mean, we talk and joke sometimes about how churches split over the carpet or, you know, the paint color. People are like, oh, I'm leaving. I can't believe you painted the church gray, you know. Uh, that didn't happen, just so you know. Uh, but what if instead of that so me-centered, we were like, oh, Okay, I don't like it, but if that's what you guys are going to do, that's great. Why? That's mutually submitting to one another. You're not worried about such things. Right? But our problem as humans is what? I'm always on my mind. <laughs> You're always on your mind. We think everyone's thinking about us, but we're all thinking about each ourselves. But what if we learn to submit one to another, which would involve having to think about one another more? Their feelings, how are they doing? That's what he means. Submitting to one another, out of, we do it because of reverence for Christ. Because he's submitted himself in ways that we can't even imagine. And so we submit one to another. And that's going to set the foundation, not just for the marriage relationship and what that looks like, but for children and parents, children submitting to parents, bosses and employees, employees submitting to bosses, Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them. Why is that? Well, because we, we get it. When it comes to a boss or someone, you know, we, we, we understand there's authority, there's roles, and even in government, Romans 13, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, so there's no authority except from God, and those that exist has been, have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Like, that means when you're driving and your pedal's to the metal, you're resisting authority. You're like, well, yeah, but everybody's going, I know. But at what point do you go, okay, I've got to dial it back a little? Like, at the point where they don't pull me over. Okay, bad illustration. <laughs> in all areas of life, we get this idea of submission to those authorities over us. If you're in school, you're submitting to the teacher or to the principal, to the people over you. If you're at work, you're submitting to your boss. And so in the church, we're to submit one to another. It creates a healthy atmosphere because what we're doing then is thinking about one another. We're not worried about a lot of other things. We're, we're, how can we bless other people? And so then verse 22 happens. Oops. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. As the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Wives, submit out of love for Christ. It may as well be a four-letter word in our culture today. You said submit? Are you telling me I have to submit to a man? I'm a woman. Like, okay, great. We get that. Why is there such pushback even within the church? Because we don't understand what Paul is talking about when he comes to submit. You should never get married if you're not able to submit to the guy you're going to marry. You're like, what? It means a healthy level of respect. That, that's really what it amounts to. There's a book on marriage called Love and Respect. Women want love, man wants respect. If you can't find someone that you can respect, 
in such a way that you're willing to go with their leadership, don't get married. Because otherwise it's going to be a problem. Wives submit. Now, one commentator said this. He says, speaking of Paul, I commanded you to submit to one another in a very general way. Now, if you do it in a general way, how much more should wives do it to their own husbands in this special relationship of marriage? And husbands, therefore, and we'll talk about them in a minute, should aim for loving, considerate, thoughtful leadership in their family. Wives should aim for active, intelligent, joyful submission to their husband's authority. You're like, this is not getting any better. This is, this is getting worse. Maybe this will help. Mere listless, thoughtless subjection is not desirable, if ever possible. The quick wit, the clear moral discernment, the fine instincts of a wife make of her a counselor whose influence is invaluable and almost unbounded. Like, what? Submission is not silence. Submission is not do what I say or else. In fact, that goes very bad. Uh, I mean, if you've ever had that experience. Okay, I've had that experience. Uh, And when you say to your wife, hey, the Bible says submit, it's not going to go well at all. The first time, the second time, uh, you're a slow learner, so the third time, uh, and eventually you realize this is not the way. This is not what I'm trying to mean. You know, this is not good. What, what does it mean then to submit? Because there's like a wall that's built, right? When you hear that word, some of you are already cringing inside. You're like, oh, I will submit to no one. Ah. What does it mean in this context? The biblical context of marriage, well, this mutual submission one to another, then this submission to a husband, right? Submit to your own husbands. This is not wives submit to every man out there. Oh, no. You submit to your husband, right? This isn't wives get at home barefoot and pregnant. That is not what I'm saying. No, no, not saying that. In fact, it has nothing to do with how it gets played out. As we go through this, there's submission and the love part. There's nothing in here that tells us what that's supposed to look like in everyday life. Why? Because it's timeless. Right? If it was written in 2,000 years ago, you know, and what did that mean for that day only? We'd be like, I don't get it. You're supposed to go get the water? Well, the water's on the tap. You know, like, like, how do all these things work? It has nothing to do with, can a wife work outside the home? Can she be a CEO? Can she, you know... All good, right? It, it says submit to your own husbands. To come under, it's this idea to line yourself under willingly, voluntarily. It's used in the military sense of soldiers submitting under the authority before them. It's used in Jesus subjecting himself to his earthly parents. Think about that. Not only did he subject himself to leaving heaven, which you know, at this point we're like, oh, that seems pretty cool. When we get to heaven, you'll be like, he left heaven to come to earth. And then he submitted himself to earthly parents. Now, many times we go, kids think, you know, they know more than their parents, especially at certain ages. Uh, guess what? Jesus knew more than his parents. He was perfect. They never had to send him to his room for a time out. They never had to take away his Xbox, take the keys from the car or the chariot, nothing. Right? He was perfect. Poor James and the others that followed him, Right? <laughs> Like, you're not like Jesus. <laughs> but he yielded himself and he subjected him, he submitted to his parents. Like, that's crazy. We submit to civil authorities, one Christian to another. So for a wife to submit to her husband, it's playing out the Jesus role in her marriage. It has nothing to do with equality. We talked about that in Galatians. We're all equal. At the foot of the cross. There's no, they're male nor female. It's not that there isn't male or female. It's just that before Jesus, before God, there's equality. right? It's not value or worth to submit to someone. It's recognizing a role and an authority placed over you. Why? Well, because it's as to the Lord. So if you're not in relationship with the Lord, you're going to have a hard time submitting because... You're fighting something that doesn't make sense outside of the Lord, right? You're trying to submit to someone who, in your own strength and power, is not going to work. 
That's why back in verse 18 it says, be filled with the Spirit. Because we can't do it on our own. We need to be filled with God's Spirit so that we can do unto the Lord what we can't do in our own flesh. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Wives submit us to the Lord and because the husband is the head. He's the head, but he's dead. You're like, the head is dead? Yeah, he's, he's not like the head as far as like the dictator, like you will do what I say. You know, that, that's not what it means at all. It's not a list of, you know, now I've got you under my thumb. Uh, it doesn't mean inferiority or silence. It means, one commentator said, submission. Submission? Yeah, there's a mission for Christian marriage, and that's the obeying and glorifying of God together. The wife says, I'm going to put myself under that mission. Even if he isn't doing all that God is telling him to do, I'm going to willingly put myself under his leadership. Even if he's a bad leader. And frankly, today, in our culture, that's part of the huge problem we have in our culture. Men are horrible leaders in the family, in the home, if they're even together, right? A couple of examples from when Rachel submitted in our marriage that, you know, if you know Rachel, you know it's a big deal, right? It doesn't come naturally to her to submit, right? Why? Because she's a strong, independent, multifaceted, talented, amazing woman. So for her to submit is to what? Is to say, okay, I'm going to willingly put myself under. So there was two particular times. There's been, you know, a few. There's not, it's not like every day, like, oh, are you submitting to me? Are you submitting? That would not go over. <laughs> but when we were living in Ukraine, and uh, Caleb was, I don't know, probably about a year and a half old, might have been shortly after he broke his collarbone, because dad was watching him. Oh. Uh, and uh, just started feeling in my spirit that it was, uh, it was time for us to return to North America. You know, that uh, we had been helping a Ukrainian plant a church in Ukraine and never actually done it on our own. So I was like, you know, I, I think it's time for us to go. If you know Rachel, she's very loyal. And friendships and people matter. And they do to me too. But, uh, <laughs> and so when I said, hey, I think it's time for us to go, she's like, no. She fought me for a little while. And then she prayed about it. And she said, you know, I'd rather stay. But I'm going to submit. You know, I don't know if she used the word because no one likes the word. Uh, but that's what it came to. When it came time to go, there wasn't like a, a tearing away. There was an understanding that we're, she was being led. And you're like, okay. Where did we go? We went to Whidbey Island, to her home. So that helped, right? Uh, until I said, I think we need to go <laughs> from your home where you love and love being around your family and all that and I think it's, where are we going to go? I don't know. But for eight months or so, maybe ten, I talked about all the places I think God was taking us to, where we were going to go to start a church. That didn't help. And so nothing could change her mind. She's like, you, I, could willingly, I could just say I submit, but it, it's not from my heart. God has to do it for me. And so she went to this pastor's wives conference in California, and she called me the one day, and you know, long story short, she said, okay. And then I was freaking out. Like, what do you mean, okay? Like, but it wasn't anything where there was a power struggle or it was like, you know, it, it was a prayerful consideration one to another and respect for one another. Wives submit, because the husband's the head. And what the head is responsible for, as we'll get into the husband, means he's responsible to God. Uh It is also a model of the relationship between Jesus and the church. So wives submit, but husbands love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The kind of love that Paul is talking about is that Greek word agape. It's not uh, eros or philia, you know, the friendship or the erotic love. He's assuming all those are there. It's Agape is that self-denial, self-sacrificial kind of love where you're thinking of the other person more. You're not thinking about yourself as much. You're thinking about the other person more. That's what it means to love 
your wife in that way. It's not demanding. It's to follow Jesus' pattern of his love for the church. And women don't settle. If you're not married, if you're on that road someday, that, I hope so. <laughs> uh, don't settle for a man who won't love you like that. Don't say, well, he's pretty good to me. You know, he gets angry sometimes. And, no, no, just, you know, <laughs> move on to the next one. Wait for someone who's going to treat you right, who treasures you, and who loves you as Christ loves the church. That's how we're supposed to love our wives. How's it going? <laughs> Charles Spurgeon, an old preacher, said this, I ask you to notice what is not always the case with regard to the husband and the wife, that the Lord Jesus loves his church unselfishly. That is to say, he never loved her for what she has, but what she is. Now, I must go further than that and say that he loved her not so much for what she is, but what he makes her as the object of his love. He loves her for not for what comes to him from her or with her, but for what he is able to bestow upon her. His is the strongest love that ever was. In Philippians chapter 2, it talks about the kind of love that Jesus had for us, where it says he emptied himself. And when he came to heaven, he emptied himself of divine attributes. He was still God, but he willingly set that aside to not use, like he wasn't on earth walking through walls, right, until after the resurrection, he wasn't reading everyone's mind all the time and doing omniscient, all-knowing. Like he, he, the Bible says he learned and grew in wisdom and stature. He had to read the Old Testament and learn it, which you know, he wrote, so he probably learned it pretty quick. Uh, but he emptied himself, and why? Because he loved us. And so Romans 5.8 says he demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, he didn't start loving you when you were a good person. Like, well, I'm pretty good, so of course God loves me. No, he, he loves us when we were still sinners, the Bible says. But he wants to take us from death to life, from sinners to saints. Like, I know a saint, you can ask everyone. We, <laughs> no, we know. But if you're in Christ, you're a saint, not an ain't. You're, you're a saint? What does that mean? Well, earlier in Ephesians, we saw that in Christ... You're moved from death to life. Not from pretty good to better, from death to life. Because the Bible says that we are dead in our sins. Right? Like if you're apart from God, you're just living life, singing do what did did dum No. Uh, doing what you normally do, you're opposed to God. You're like, oh, I don't even think there is a God. I'm not even sure. Well, you're, then you're opposed to him. You're an enemy of God. And Jesus is that bridge between death and life. And when you move from death to life, it's not just like pretty good. Like that's from death to life. That's amazing, right? And so then in Christ, you experience his love. And he loves you. Not for who you're going to be. He loves you right now for who you are. And he loves you who you are even if you're not in Christ yet. That's amazing, we usually don't start loving someone until we get to know them, right? Or until we kind of see if we like their character a little, enough. But God loves us even when our character was not good. Hmm. How does this work for the husband to love? And what does it mean that he's the head? Well, there's a big difference between what the world says and what the Bible says. The world says, I'm your head, so you take orders from me and you have to do what I say. That is not what the, God, the Bible says. Godly headship says, I'm your head, so I must care for and serve you. Right? It says, he loved the church and gave himself up for her. There's a cherishing and a nourishing in verse 29 that it talks about. We're, we're to care. The world says, you must submit to me. There are things I want you to do for me. Godly submission says, you must submit to me so I'm accountable for God, before God to you. I must care for you and serve you. Right? Either or, and here's the problem, is often one side or the other waits for the other. Right? Oh, I'll love them when they respect me. I'll love her when she respects me. You're like, stalemate. Right? It doesn't work, because right? you're trying on your own. But guess what? If you're going towards Christ and you're both mutually submitting to him, you're going to mutually submit to one another and then the roles could start to happen. And so then... 
the husband's going to love and the wife's going to respect and it's going to work. It's not going to be perfect. There's no such thing. It says in the same way, verse 28, husbands should love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. Oh, let's back up. Verse 26. Sorry. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle, that she might be holy and without blemish. What's going on there? Well, there was Christ has come and he's washed us, right? Because of his death on the cross, his blood has washed us, it makes us clean, makes us a new creation in Christ, makes us holy, set apart. The other aspect of that holiness is wholeness. You're complete in God. And so when Christ has washed you by the word of God, you're whole in Christ. That's the job of the husband with the wife. You're like, what? The husband's supposed to wash the wife with the word. You're like, I have to do a Bible study with my wife. You're supposed to cover her to wash her. You're like, this seems weird. Is it like a bubble bath? Or like, what kind of wash are we talking <laughs> That's up to you. Uh, that's a different thing. It's the idea that we all need constantly washing in the word, cleansing. Our, our hearts and our lives need purifying, right? Because this idea of being holy and without blemish, it doesn't happen just by wishing upon a star. It doesn't happen by clicking your heels. It happens by what? The word of God and the spirit of God coming in to do what? To change your mindset and your words and then your actions, and so the husband's accountable to God for how he does that. They're like, what? Yeah. Jesus is cleansing his church. He does that through the word. As we read the Bible, it has that purifying work and aspect to our lives so that we become more like him. That's the goal in marriage, that we become more like Jesus. Jesus. Right? And then people go, you guys start to seem like you're the same. You know? As long as you start dressing the same, you know, that gets a little spooky. You know? but, but what happens is, as you, the more you become like Jesus, the more you kind of seem the same. Right? Because your goal is the same, to mutually submit to Jesus and then to one another. And so you're not having this argument like, I'm the head. Well, I was, I'm not going to submit to you. you know? uh, you're going to do it. Why? Because you're loving Jesus. And you see that he's got a plan. Hmm. She says, the husband should love their wives as their own bodies. The implication, everybody loves themselves, right? It's not like, you need to love yourself a little more, you know. No, that generally is taken care of. Why? Because you're always thinking about yourself. That's just how it goes. So he says, love your wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Hmm. One guy said this, a man must love his wife as he would his body as part of himself. As Eve was part of Adam, taken out of his side, so the wife is to the man because she is part of him. The reality of this union must dominate the husband's thinking and actions in marriage. The apostle puts it in this form in order that a husband may see that he cannot dis detach himself from his wife. You cannot detach yourself from your body, so you cannot detach yourself from your wife. She is a part of you. So remember that always. He who loves his wife loves himself. Put it another way, when you love yourself, you benefit yourself. In the negative, when you neglect your wife, you neglect yourself and it'll come back to hurt you. Hmm. Wives got it easy. In one sense, you're like, oh no, it's not easy to submit. Loving your wife, caring for her like Christ cared for the church, washing her in the word, the responsibility falls on the man. You're like, yeah, see, it should fall on the women. Well, why does it fall on the man? How does that work? Well, the Bible teaches in 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Timothy 2 that it's because of the order of creation. That's part of the roles that we have. It's not equality. It's not superiority. None of those things, right? We're all equal, but we all have different roles and functions. And so because man was created first, he was given the responsibility. We read it in Genesis chapter 2. He was given the responsibility of what they weren't supposed to do. Right? Don't eat from that tree. He had to communicate it to his wife. Did a bad job. And that's why it says sin came through Adam, even though Eve ate the apple or fruit first. 
We're like, oh. She's still responsible, right? We're all responsible for our own choices, but he was held accountable. And so it says, sin comes through the man, and thus all have sinned. Oh. Like, I'm never getting married. That seems like craziness. Well, it is a little. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. He quotes back from Genesis. Just in case they weren't getting it all, this is biblical. This is foundational. Back in Genesis, this is God's plan. This is how it's supposed to look and work. And then he says, this mystery is profound. And he says, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. You're like, I thought we were talking about marriage. It's like a little break. break time out. We're going to talk about Christ and the church. You're like, what? What's happening? This picture of marriage is pictured between Jesus and the church, how he laid down his life for the church, he washes the church in the, the word, he's died, for, he does everything for. Oh, that's what the husband is for the wife. Lay down your life for your wife. And then he comes back, verse 33. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Love and respect. This is what it comes down to, right? Some of them could be, seem complicated, but at its root, it comes down to love and respect. Thinking of yourself less and thinking of the other person more. And that's the problem, is we're always thinking of ourselves more. And so to surrender ourself and our own thinking and our own ideas and being right and to surrender, man, that's God's picture of marriage and of the Christian life. It's not easy, but it's worth it. And it's, what he says is healthy and right. Now maybe, you know, you've had different experiences and your marriage exploded and it died. And you're like, now what? What does that mean for me? Well, it could mean several things. Maybe you're going to get married again. You're like, I don't think so. <laughs> then maybe not. But what it means is, now you understand what it's supposed to look like. Even if that wasn't true in what you had, here's what it, did you do what you were supposed to do? Did you submit? Did you love? You're like, not very well. There's forgiveness. Then you move on. Right? There's grace for that. That's the amazing thing. You don't have to like, wallow in pity or in condemnation for the rest of your life because of mistakes from the past. That's what 1 John 1, 9 says. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And it takes two to tangle, two to mess up. You know, usually more than one person has done something, right? It means if you're looking someday that you're probably going to get married, there's a high standard. Don't settle on either side, if you're a guy or if you're a girl. Don't, don't settle for just the first guy that comes knocking on your door. Don't settle for the first girl that bats her eyes. <laughs> you, you wait for God's best. That might be when you're really long, right? There's stories where little kids grow up together and like, oh, they're so sweet, and they get married. You're like, how did that happen? There's other stories where you go to a Christian university, mm, don't find anyone. I went to Bible College. It was more commonly called Bridal College. Like, ring by spring or your money back. <laughs> uh, didn't find a wife there. God sent me to Ukraine. They warned me about Ukrainian women. They said, you know, we've had some guys go over, and they keep getting married to Ukrainians, which wasn't bad, it's just that they would leave the mission field. So, like, why are you really going? Oh, I'm going over there for Jesus, you know. And then the, this American showed up. God had a different plan blindsided like i was on guard against those these ukrainians nope not looking nope nope i'm here with jesus and then we went for thanksgiving and there was rachel it was over right like it took her a little longer to know that but you know she knew it deep down We would have a lot less problems or divorces or if we were slower in the ramp up. You're like, what? Well, work on your relationship with God first. Right? If you're a young person, that's where you start. You just get to know Jesus more and more. As you get older, then you start to go, okay, God, whenever, I'm ready. And he's like, mm, not yet. 
And for some, it's okay, right now, you bring that person along. And others are like, no, you got 10 years. They're like, what? We knew a missionary gal that was over in Ukraine with us. She was a Southern Baptist, and she was 30, and she wasn't married. You know, and that was like a big no-no over there. And she just waited. And then she went off the mission field, and she got married at 35 or 36. You don't know. 40? You never know, right? Marriage is not the highest high of life, right? We talked about that a couple weeks ago when we talked about sexual immorality and how it's been idolatrized even within the church, that sex is like up here and everything else is down here. And the problem is when you do that, you're going to do whatever it takes to get to there, right? Well, then you find out, oh, that's not, you're not, that's not every day, right? You're not like all the time in the bedroom, right? You have to live life. So you need more than that. Oh. Wives submit, husbands love. It's a high calling. If you need help, if there's things not going well in your marriage, don't hide it. Don't say, oh, it'll be fine. We'll work it out someday, we think. I mean, we've been married 20 years. And there's like prog- progress, right? There's progress? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's slow, right? Because I'm slow to learn, but there's progress, right? We, we resolve things quicker. We say things kinder and hopefully more often. And usually that's just me that's messing up, right? Um, but it's an ongoing growth thing. As we, and you think, well, I'm going to start over because I'm not very happy. That's not going to help. You're like, well, I have so many years of experience being married, so it'll help a lot when I get married to this person because I'm going to be happy. Uh, nope. Why? Because now you've got two different sets of experiences, but that aren't together, and you've got to bring those together. You're like, is that hard? Yeah, it's hard. We've got some living examples of that, right? And here's the thing. Gary Thomas wrote a book called Sacred Marriage. He said, what if God didn't make marriage to make us happy, but to make us holy? Our culture puts happiness as the highest of highs. God puts holiness set apart unto him and complete in him. That's what one flesh means. You're complete together in him. Should you be happy? Yeah, that, that's part of it, right? But sometimes it's just tough. Like there's seasons where it just, there's a struggle. You got to go through it. But through the suffering, through the struggles, become great strength. Right? If you never work out, you're never going to get strong. Just how it goes. So struggles are not the end. It's not like, oh, well, we fight, so we shouldn't be together anymore because I'm not very happy. It's called you're human. And you're, you have irreconcilable differences because one's a man, one's a female. There's always going to be irreconcilable differences. Always. How do you live with that together? Love and respect. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for loving us so unconditionally and so well. For sending your son Jesus to die on that cross that we might have life and life more abundantly. And we ask God that you would speak to us right now, right where we're at. You know what's going on in our lives.